In the past, I've covered the original version of Baxter Stockman and his adaptation into TV. But to comic fans, that adaptation was puzzling at best. You can check out the videos I made of those two to better understand what the reasons for his race bending were. But the 2003 cartoon was trying to respect the source material as much as possible, while still creating a new universe that could stand apart. This is the story of Dr. Baxter Stockman. The 30-something character was voiced by Scott Williams, who also lent his voice to other projects like Pokemon and Super Smash Bros. While he was initially created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird in 1984, this version was adapted by Marty Eisenberg for the cartoon. While the character's background was almost left unexplored in the comics, in this adaptation, it was established that he grew up in a lower middle class family, and he had a passion for science from a very young age. This passion was supported by his mother, who sacrificed everything to make sure he could dedicate his life to science. This also meant she wasn't always around, as she needed more than one job to keep their way of life. <laughs> and remember, the sky's the limit for you, baby doll. But his passion for science didn't leave enough room for ethics. From an early age, he demonstrated signs of cruelty to other beings, beings that were weaker than him like roaches. This cruelty was somehow kept under control thanks to the love and dedication of his mother. Unfortunately, she worked herself to death, and Baxter lost her while he was still young. This event may have planted the need for cheating death through the help of science. As time passed, Baxter became a brilliant man, admired by others. He created his own company, Stocktronics Industries. One of his inventions was the Mouser, a rat-killing device. He hired an assistant, April O'Neil, a software engineer for this project. April admired Baxter, and she was very proud of working for him. This type of adulation worked very well with Baxter, who may have considered some romantic implications with her at some point. But things weren't as they seemed. The Foot Clan secretly funded the Mouser Project not to solve the rat problem, but to steal money and valuables from the New York City banks to support the Shredder's own projects. It didn't take April long to figure out some things that looked suspicious, and after spying on her boss, she found out about the involvement of a dark figure. Baxter didn't want any witnesses, and sent the Mousers after her. She escaped into the sewer system where she was fortunate enough to be rescued by the Turtles, who were tracking one of these robots back to its source. After figuring out the true purpose of the Mousers, April and the Turtles, just like they did in the comics, went back to Stocktronics to shut down the main controller. Unable to deactivate the Mousers and being swarmed by them, April managed to overload them, blowing up the building with them. Baxter survived thanks to the quick intervention of Hun. However, he would have been better off dead. The Shredder saw the need to punish his failure, and Baxter lost an eye in the process. Now under the control of the Shredder, Baxter worked on improving the Foot Clan technology. While doing so, he created the Foot Tech Ninja, who, unlike their regular counterparts, had the ability to become invisible. This eventually ended in failure, and after another punishment, Baxter ended up in a wheelchair with a broken neck and without his left hand. But Baxter wasn't merely a minion of the Shredder. He saw potential in the constant stream of budget from the underworld to create groundbreaking things. He could, however, do away with the Shredder's bad temper. Intrigued by the recovered Utrom exosuit, Baxter made a deal with the Shredder. If he could find evidence that the turtles really died in the fire at the second time around store, he would have full access to research the suit. After manipulating the evidence, he convinced the Shredder that the turtles had died in the fire, and he finally got his hands on the exosuit. But this wasn't simply driven by his curiosity. He planned to use it to get revenge on everybody. And the time for revenge happened during the turtles' attack on the Foot headquarters. Baxter used his new armor to fight the turtles and the Shredder. After a long battle, he was defeated, and his armor blew up to pieces in the sky. But no, he wasn't dead. He was recovered from the blast and was now just a head on a spider-like robot. The Shredder still needed the great intellect of Baxter Stockman, so he implanted a device in his skull to shock him whenever he needed to punish him. As long as the Shredder had control over him, he would need to do what he said. In this case, he had to take control of the Transmat device to let Shredder get revenge at the Utroms. But the Fugitoid freed Baxter from the Shredder's control, and Baxter didn't waste one minute before attacking the Shredder. 
He managed to escape, and while the Foot Clan survived, it looked like the Shredder was dead, at least for a while. With Shredder out of the way, Baxter befriended Leatherhead, and together they created a turtle bot to get revenge on the turtles. But after name-dropping Shredder in their fight, Leatherhead figured out he was being used, as Shredder was an enemy of the Utrams who were his friends. Baxter found a new source of money by allying himself with the mob. During this period, he created a new armor for himself and created some killing machines to fight against the Foot Clan and recover some of that turf for the mob. This ended abruptly once Karai arrived in the city and took control of the clan, and Baxter was captured and then reduced to just his brain with only one eye floating inside a canister. After they used him to create the foot mechs, his lab inside a freighter went down in flames and was almost lost floating at sea. But sadly, he was found by the Foot Clan again. With nothing else to lose, Baxter was now more in control of his own situation. During this period, he started projecting his human head holographically above his canister. But this confidence wouldn't last long. The Foot Clan brought in his replacement, Dr. Chaplin, a young man who admired Baxter and really wanted to work with him. It didn't take more than a few seconds for Baxter to realize he was being replaced, and he started sabotaging Dr. Chaplin's work to make himself irreplaceable. In gratitude to his mentor, Dr. Chaplin created a new armor for Baxter, now with a holographic head. But Baxter was still unsure about his survival and conspired with Han to get rid of Karai and Dr. Chaplin in the floating city of Beijing, which is a story for its own video. Their murder attempt backfired, and Shredder put them on some punishment work. Without Dr. Chaplin's admiration, he needed to act quickly to survive the Shredder's bad temper. This led Baxter to make a deal with Agent Bishop. After all, a government agency was a much better income stream than the Foot Clan. He would help Bishop get his hands on the Shredder, and in exchange, he would be able to work on making a new human body for himself, something that would have come out from helping Bishop get his conscience into a new clone body. Baxter betrayed the Shredder and, after blowing up his starship, he cemented his relationship with Agent Bishop and the Earth Protection Force. This was a turning point for Baxter. While he was still being used for his intellect, his relationship with Bishop wasn't as cruel as the one with his former employer. In the alternate future story, same as it never was, his brain was attached to Han, who was now in a wheelchair. Both of them were now rebels working side by side with April. It was during this episode that we first heard Baxter wish he'd been taken out of his misery a long time ago, something that ended up happening at the hands of the Shredder. But back to the present, Baxter, now in a spider-inspired armor, was helping the EPF fake an alien invasion. To do this, he created some fake aliens. This mission was a success in ensuring the president gave the agency enough funds to continue their work. But a horrible side effect was the polluting of the sewer system, which created mutated creatures and an outbreak of mutated monsters. Baxter captured one of these monsters and started working on a cure. But his mind wasn't on creating a cure. He had already succeeded in creating a new body for Agent Bishop and had no reason to postpone creating a new human body for himself. To Bishop, this was a mistake. After all, the current outbreak was one of Baxter's failed experiments, an experiment that was deeply related to the research behind his new body. But Baxter didn't want to wait anymore, and he transferred his mind into a clone. Initially, Baxter was euphoric. He could experience all his senses again, and even eat and do other things humans with bodies could do. This sensory stimulation made Baxter ignore some important red flags in his new body. Not only were things not going okay, but he was also hallucinating, and it didn't take long for his new body to start falling apart. In his temporary insanity, it didn't take him long to blame April O'Neil for all his misfortunes, which he kidnapped and brought to the abandoned Stocktronics building. In his hallucinations, Baxter started seeing his mother, whose body also failed her in her last moments. Despite Casey and the Turtles' intervention to save April, Baxter managed to corner her again. She tried to dissuade Baxter, and while doing this, she told him that the sky was the limit for him something that his mother used to say to him. Baxter saw his mother instead of April and decided to save her life, something he couldn't do when he was younger. You probably heard a lot about this episode because it was highly controversial for its graphic content. It was supposed to air in March of 2006, 
but it was pulled off the air for being unsuitable for air. The reason the episode was produced at all was that there was a change in the Fox broadcast standards and practices staff during the production of it. After seeing the episodes, the new people on board were horrified by it. Lloyd Goldfein, the mastermind behind the show, admitted that the episode went too far. Still, the episode was only banned from the US, but was aired in other regions. It was eventually released in the Season 4 DVD, and Nickelodeon finally aired it in 2015. In the original draft of Insane in the Membrane, there were even more details about Baxter's backstory. He had an abusive father that, when he was 14, got into a fight with his mother, after he took Baxter's scholarship money. It was explained in that flashback that Baxter was already accepted into university at the young age of 14. In the scene where Baxter confused April with his own mother, he would have hallucinated a memory of Baxter being unable to protect her from his abusive father. Peter Laird didn't like this draft as he felt it perpetuated unfair stereotypes. Instead, Peter suggested making April say those familiar words to Baxter to make him change. However, Peter suggested making Baxter realize he was doing the wrong thing, which wasn't what ended up happening in the episode. Bishop rescued Baxter, and his brain was now in a new body that had a mix of robotics and flesh. After seeing himself in this body, he truly regretted being still alive. With the help of Leatherhead, Baxter was able to finally find a cure for the outbreak. After this, he continued working for Agent Bishop. Baxter then started disguising his horrifying form with a holographic exterior around his body. He used a new armor during the battle against the One True Shredder, where he was almost killed. At the end of the battle, Bishop continued keeping Baxter alive against his wishes. But at some point, he must have escaped Agent Bishop's control, and he started working with Han in a new cybernetic vessel, hacking the foot databases to find things to steal from them. His idea was to fund a new armor for himself. But this didn't go well for him, as the Cyber Shredder took over his new body. Baxter had to eject from his body and seek help from Donatello to get back to his body. At some point later, Baxter tried to get revenge on the Turtles, the Foot Clan, and the Purple Dragons, sending dinosaurs to hunt them. The Turtles found the source of these dinosaurs to be Baxter, who is now controlling them from an island. After deactivating the signals that made the dinosaurs angry, Baxter realized he was surrounded by very peaceful and cute dino pets. Baxter would continue working for Agent Bishop for 50 years, researching alien DNA to create an invincible army to protect the planet. This led to his creation of the organic Mousers. One day, Baxter had an accident in his lab. With fire consuming everything, Agent Bishop was rescued by an alien, which completely changed his mind on how to protect the planet. With Baxter apparently dead, Agent Bishop left his idea of an alien army behind and eventually became the president of the Galactic Council. It was like the UN of the universe. Fast forward to 2105, Agent Bishop was under attack by these organic mousers, who he thought were destroyed. He contacted the turtles who were trapped in the future and asked for their help against Baxter, who is now closer to an alien but still a brain with one eye. Baxter wasn't aware of Bishop's accomplishments during these 50 years that he spent reconstructing his lab and researching alien DNA. During that period, Baxter was unable to create a body for himself, and since the only time he succeeded was with Agent Bishop's clone body, he figured out he was the key to having flesh again. He kidnapped him and tried to transfer his mind to his. Knowing that Bishop was now essential to peace in the universe, Leonardo tried to convince Baxter not to kill him. After all, thanks to his actions, they could now walk openly in the streets. And even Baxter would be able to walk without being considered a monster. And then Leo asked him a key question. Was he a monster or a man? This gave him enough time to rescue Agent Bishop from a collapsing lab. But this time, Agent Bishop didn't want to leave Baxter behind and saved him. In the aftermath, Bishop revealed to Baxter that it was now viable to make a new body for himself. Baxter was skeptical at first. Burned by the past actions of his former employers, he suspected this was just another ruse to use him. But Bishop told him that the Department of Agriculture was interested in the organic mousers. In that way, Baxter finally got legit. He did ask if there was such a thing as a vice president of the Galactic Council, so he was still super ambitious. Nevertheless, the compassion demonstrated by Bishop was, perhaps, all that he was missing since his mother died. 
the kindness that used to keep him on track. This was the first version of Baxter to introduce the backstory and motivations of the character, or at least convincing motivations for his actions. This in turn inspired future adaptations, the clearest one being the IDW comics, where he became a true headache for enemies and allies alike. Now, you're all very well aware that Baxter became a mutated fly in other iterations of the franchise. But did you know that he was already turned into a cyborg in the comics? Check out this other video to learn more about it. Thanks for watching.